Growing up, I was part of the generation that would run the streets, or maybe I just wasn't loved enough as a kid, but my parents let me run the streets growing up. Uh, and I would be out on a Saturday from the moment I woke up before my parents would wake up, and I would be coming home about dusk, you know, when the sun's setting and night is coming in. That's about the time I would roll back into the house. And it wasn't one of those days where your parents would be calling the police. There was no homeland security, like, alerted, like, where's Chris at? We're so worried. No, they knew Chris was taking care of his own. He was fine. As long as he's out of our hair, <laughs> we're good. And uh, maybe some of you kind of relate to those days. You know, the days where you could get on your bicycle and just ride around the city and no one was worried about where you would be. I would die inside if my kids did that today. I mean, my kids are a lot younger than I was doing that, but still, I would die. Like, they, they will not have as much freedom as I had. But my family really gave me three rules. My parents gave me three rules to live by when I was running the streets. And they said this, number one, how far am I allowed to go was the first rule. Like, what's the distance I'm allowed to go from the house? And they said, you can go to the city limits. As long as you don't go past the city limits, we're good. So the town I grew up in, even though it was Los Angeles, it, Los Angeles is actually built up of a lot of little cities that surround Los Angeles. And I'm from a little town called Monrovia that's about the size of like Satsuma and Sarah Land mixed together. Maybe, maybe we'll add Chickasaw into that, and that'd be about the population of the town and about the size that I grew up in. And so they're like, you know, just stay in town. Don't leave the area. Don't go past the border of Monrovia, okay? That was rule number one. Number two, I needed to know when I needed to be home. And so what my parents would tell me was, just be home, you know, when you see the sky changing colors. When it turns dusk, start heading home, okay? And then rule number three was be safe. Be safe. And here's how be safe would be translated. Don't do anything dumb, like don't do drugs, and don't get in any fights. Uh, stay away from the gangs, because I live in Los Angeles, and there's lots of gangs. Like every other neighborhood's controlled by a different gang. It's kind of like the mob on the streets at a low level of crime. So like, stay away from the gangs. Don't get jumped. Don't get stabbed. Be in the good areas of the town. And uh, don't get in trouble with the law. And so those are the rules that my parents set for me when I'd run the streets. Now, do you think I lived by those rules? Do you think those are the rules that I actually was like listening to them? How did I interpret those rules? Here's how I would interpret those rules and live them out. Distance from the house, the rule number one. Well, you know, I'm to stay within the city limits. So the place that I want to hang out the most is on the edges of town. Why be in the middle of town when I can be at the edges, pushing the limit. And you know, over time, I would learn what was just five minutes past the edge of town. And like, surely mom and dad wouldn't get too upset if I went to the Whataburger in Chickasaw versus the Whataburger here in Sarah Land, right? That same kind of logic. Surely they wouldn't get mad if I went to the burger joint just five minutes past the edge of town. And so that was kind of how I stretched the rule a little bit when it was to the boundaries of where I was allowed to play in. Uh, rule number two, do you know how I interpreted when it was time to be home? It wasn't when the, sky, the sun went down and the sky turned pink. It wasn't when the sky started turning light violet. It was when the sky turned purple. When it turns purple, I started to head home. So I gave myself an extra 30 minutes of playtime that my parents probably would not want me to have. And in my opinion as an adult, that's on them because they left it up for interpretation. Dusk is, what is dusk, you know? Uh, and then the third rule, which was be safe. Come on, who are you kidding? Like, I grew up in California, so maybe you were riding bicycles around the streets. Although, you know, my assumption was it'd be more like ATVs and fishing poles and shotguns to go shoot deer with, right? Here, and that's how Alabama rolls, right? Well, in California, we don't have any of that. We're skaters. So we're like skateboarders and rollerbladers, and skating was a thing. And we weren't just like skating like a skate rink. No, we're the bad kids, we're sliding down ledges and going down handrails. Like California, skating is a thing. Unless you lived on the beach, then you were a surfer. But I didn't live near the beach at that point in my life. So we were skaters. And there is no such thing as be safe as a skater. You're going to break your arms. You're going to get cut. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to get in trouble with the law because no one wants a skateboarder on their, their property of their business, messing up their curbs and their ledges and all that, right? You've seen that before. No one wants that. And so there was no such thing as being safe. And mom and dad, if you don't want me around gangs, let's move outside of Los Angeles, okay? That's just the thing that's going to happen living in Los Angeles. 
Now, maybe it's been some time for you since your parents have laid down the law, like, and told you, what are some rules to live by? What are some parameters to live by? But all of us have, like, basic rules in our life that we try to go by, some basic framework that we try to live by. And honestly, even in our adult sense, I know that if you're anything like me, which you probably are, because I'm not the only person in humanity that lives life a little bit more on the edge. And maybe you're thinking, no, not me, Pastor Chris. I'm conservative. And I don't mean like voting or maybe your religious practice, but like just in life, you're a conservative human being and you're just a little bit more safer than the rest. Okay. Well, let me ask you a question. How's your driving? What speed do you drive at? Do you drive at the posted speed limit or do you drive above the speed limit? I know Alabama drives above the speed limit because every time I get on the highway, you guys are trying to run me off the road. I drive a minivan, and you guys let me know that I drive a gutless minivan as you guys are swerving all around me. No, we don't drive the speed limit. We drive past the speed limit. But we fool, like we're, we've convinced ourselves it's okay, right? We've convinced ourselves at the posted speed limit is 70 miles per hour. We've convinced ourselves I can go 80 And as long as I don't go above 80, I won't have an encounter with the law. And so we've convinced ourselves that it's okay to break this rule in my life. And so the reality is we all have some way, somehow, that we're kind of stretching the rules, kind of bending the rules, or going past the rules. Because we start looking at life in categories, in the category as right and wrong. And this leads me to my first comparison slide here. We start looking at stuff like, well, you know what, if it's not illegal, then maybe it's legal, right? There should be a slide for that. If there's not, let's see if it comes up. Nope, no slide. There we go. Legal or illegal, right? We start, well, if it's not illegal, then it must be legal for me to do. And if it's legal for me to do, then it's okay. What about responsible? As long as I'm responsible, as long as I don't do anything irresponsible, then it must be responsible. And we'll start justifying a lot of things that we're doing in the two categories. What about immoral, moral? As long as it's not immoral, then it has to be moral, right? And so I'm okay because I'm being a moral person because that is immoral and I'm not there yet. I'm close, but not there yet. What about ethical or unethical? You get where I'm going with this, right? Where we kind of like straddle the line. We get right up on the edge of disaster, get right up on the edge of embarrassment, and we start trying to figure out basically how low can we go. And maybe you're like, Chris, I don't think this way. Maybe so, but probably not. If you're a normal human being, you probably stretch it in one way or another. And I think this kind of comes from a flawed way of thinking. You see, This whole series that we're in called Five Years From Now, the goal of this series is that we start getting to the place where we want to be later on in life. And so if you want to be somewhere great in life, like maybe you have dreams, you have goals, you have hopes, and you want to get there, we've got to start making some better decisions. That's what this whole series has been about. And we've kind of talked about how there's some people who feel like they never get their dreams, their goals, their hopes. It never happens for them. Something holds them back. Something keeps them from being there. And they're like, why is it always in the cards for them, but not for me? Is it fate? Is it reality? Is it the universe? Is it God not letting me have those hopes, dreams, and desires that I have for my life one day? I mean, possibly, but probably more often than not, it's the decisions that we're making in life over and over and over that are setting us up for either success or for failure when it comes to our dreams, goals, and hopes. And I think it's because we have, and I say we broadly, but you know, people make the wrong assumption when they're making decisions. We start making the wrong assumption when we're making decisions. Because we just assume if there's a right and a wrong, and those are the two categories we got to figure out what we're living in. I'm either choosing to do the right thing or the wrong thing. And so we start telling ourselves, well, you know, if it's not wrong, then it must be all right. If it's not illegal, it must be permissible. If it's not immoral, then it's acceptable. And if it's not over the line, then it's fine, right? And that's why we get 
people making all kinds of silly decisions. Let me explain. Is it illegal for an 80-year-old man to marry or date a 20-year-old woman? Of course not. Go back to that slide. Of course not. Doesn't make it the right thing to do, but it's not illegal. Is it really permissible? Uh, I don't know. Is it acceptable? Is it immoral? Uh, I don't know. I don't know why I'm going down that rabbit trail. But you get what I'm saying. Just because you can legally do something, just because you're not going to get locked up for it, doesn't make it either right or wrong. There has to be a third path that we can take. And if you're an older brother or sister, I want you to put your older brother or sister hat on. If you're a parent, I want you to put your parent hat on for a moment. Because that's setting the bar real low, isn't it? But none of us would want that for our kids. None of us would want our kids to try to live that way. And we'd be concerned if we saw them living that way. Because again, we're asking ourselves, you know what? Just how much can I get away with before I go into the area of living wrong? Like how much is it when I go from being right to being wrong? wrong? Where's that line? Where's that threshold? How far can I take it until I go from ethical to unethical or immoral? How, uh, basically, how far can I push it? If you're religious, you would think this way. How far can I push it? How far can I go until I step into sin? Like, where's the boundary? How close to sin can I get without actually sinning? And how do I spend as much time there as possible? Right? And it's in human nature that we want to straddle these lines. We want to, like, push it to the limits. We want to know all of the benefits and perks. We want to know how far on the outer edge we can get. But we don't want anyone else doing that, right? We wouldn't want our kids doing this, right? And we know all of this. Everything I'm saying right now It's common knowledge, right? I haven't said anything to you so far. You're like, oh my gosh, I've got to take this down. We all know this stuff. In your gut, you know this stuff. And it's why you get upset. It's why you get upset when you see a loved one doing this. When you see a loved one doing something, it's actually not the act of what they're doing that you're upset about. It's the path, the road, the journey they're about to go on. It's it's where they're headed in life that you get concerned and upset and worried about a loved one because you don't want to see them going down that road. And again, we've came to the conclusion that if we're going to get to some of our dreams, our goals, our hopes in life, we've got to start making some better decisions as individuals. And so over the course of this sermon series, we've been talking about how do you make some great decisions in your life? How do you make decisions that are great so that way you do end up having your long-term dreams come out to a reality? And so every week we've been wrestling with this topic and we leaned into scripture because we decided we want to avoid future regrets, we want to make good decisions, and we want to get long-term to where we want to be in life. We want to have those dreams, those goals, and those hopes come to a reality. And so throughout this, this, this conversation, five years from now, over the last few weeks, we've made the decision that we don't just need to make good decisions, but we have to start asking great questions. Because great questions lead to better decision making. Asking the right questions gives you the right information for you to actually make the right decision. And if you make the right decision, maybe, just maybe, you can avoid some future regrets. Actually, more often than not, you can avoid future regrets. And that's all what we all want, right? No one wants to sign up for a regret. No one's like, woo, sign me up. I want a future regret. No, regrets are those things that we say, shoulda, coulda, woulda. What could I have done different? If I had a time machine, I would go back in time and expunge that regret from my life. I would do it completely different. I don't want those regrets in my life. No one wants a regret in their life, right? And so we want to avoid those regrets. And so we found a verse in Scripture called Proverbs chapter 27, verse 12. And here's what it said. The prudent see danger and take refuge. The prudent see danger and take refuge. But the simple, the simple keep going and pay the penalty. The simple keep going and pay the penalty. Now, you remember a moment ago I said there's like a group that seems to be able to get to their dreams, their goals, their hopes, where they want to be in life. And then there's another group that seems to never get there. I've been part of both groups, and maybe you have too. Scripture calls one group the prudent and the other the simple. I like to take it a step further and say the simple-minded, okay? 
And so here's how this works. The simple, they're just like trying to make decisions. We're like, ooh, there's a lot of pressure on me today. I've got desires. I've got wants. I've got needs. I've got people speaking in my life. I've got some decisions to make today. And then you don't understand it, but my life is complicated, and it's hard, and it's stressful. And so what I'm going through today, it's just too much for me to handle. And so I can't worry about that tomorrow. That tomorrow's got to be taken care of some other day. It's got to figure out its own problems when tomorrow comes. Today, I've got to focus on just today. And that seems logical when we say it that way. Except for when you're only making decisions for today, you can sabotage where you're going tomorrow. You see, the prudent person, they have all the same stress that the simple person has. They have wants, they have needs, they have desires, they have pressure from outside pushing them in to make decisions. But the prudent person says, wait a minute, this decision that I'm about to make can impact my tomorrow. It can mess up where I want to be long term. And so if I say yes to this, I'm actually saying no to a future dream, hope, or goal. And so in this moment, I'm going to pass on that. I'm not going to engage. I'm going to say no to that. And the prudent person actually steps back for an opportunity today so they can get to their opportunities of tomorrow. You see, the prudent person sees the danger in the decisions that they have to make. The prudent person sees the danger in what's happening ahead of them. And they say, I don't want any of that, so I'm going to run away from that because that is trying to destroy my life. Some people are like actually looking at the door that I keep pointing to. (laughs) Anyways, so there's two groups of people. We've leaned onto this scripture, and we started asking questions over the last few weeks. In your outline, you'll see some of the previous week's questions there. If you missed anything in this series, and this sounds like something that you want to get caught up on, because this series radically changed my life 15 years ago, and I want it to radically change your life as well. Um, If you want to get caught up on it, jump on YouTube, because we have a YouTube channel, believe it or not, and you can just scroll five years from now, Wilson Avenue Church, it'll pop back up, and you'll be able to catch up on the sermons that you missed. Or you can always log on our church app and find it that way as well. So let's talk about this week's question. This week's question is called the maturity question. The maturity question. There we go. The maturity question. And the maturity question is this. What is the wise thing to do? What is the wise thing to do? That seems too simple, doesn't it? I mean, that almost feels like a WWJD. Like, what is the wise thing to do? You know, I was sitting in your spot about 15 years ago, and I heard a pastor preach a message about this question and ask this question And my life was a horrible mess. It was a hot mess. I mean, I was divorced. I had an alcohol addiction. I was in debt beyond my control. Couldn't even go to McDonald's and buy a cheeseburger because there was no money left in the bank account. I was codependent. I had a codependent streak running through me. Uh, I've had self-worth issues. I felt very alone in the world and really kind of was left feeling hopeless. And then I was sitting where you're sitting, and the pastor said, what is the wise thing to do? And he really expanded on this question. He said this, actually. Let's go to the next slide. In light of your past experiences, your current circumstances, and your future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for you to do? Basically, with your past and what you're going through now, And where you hope to be one day, what is the wise thing for you to do? Asking this question radically changed my life. You see, it didn't change my life in that moment, but I started to say, okay, I've tried it the world's way. Okay, I've done it the way how society says I should live, and my life was a horrible, terrible mess, miserable. And so I'm like, okay, let's try it what the pastor says. Let's see what God has to say and do in my life. And so I started with the small decisions. Okay, God, what's, what should I do here? What's the wise thing for me to do? What I didn't know in that moment, what I was doing was I was picking a third path to live on. You see, up until that point, it was either right or wrong, right or wrong. And if it wasn't illegal, then it was legal. So it must be right. Yeah, you know? And so I always looked at life in two categories like most of us do. 
But when I started asking that question, I started asking, what's the wise thing to do? And I found when I asked that question and started living my life that way, there's a third option. There's a third path you can go down in life. And it makes all the difference. I started with the small questions, you know, should I go here? Should I eat here? What's the wise thing to eat today? I'm trying not to get drunk anymore, so what's the wise thing? Should I hang out with that crowd anymore? Should I avoid that area? What's the wise thing? I'm, you know, I want to get out of debt one day. What's the wise thing should I do? You know, I just need to learn how to follow Jesus. That's where I started. And I'm like, what's the wise thing to do? If I want to learn how to follow this Jesus guy, how do I follow him? And so I joined a small group. Host a small group. It changes lives. We saw it in the video a moment ago. I joined a small group because I figured, what's the wise thing to do? Seems pretty wise to join the small group. So I started attending the small group, and it was in the context of community that I started to get mentored and discipled, and people poured into my life, and they called me out nicely in some ways. You know, they showed me some of my shortcomings, and it wasn't like in a mean, let me beat you with the stick, just like, hey, Chris, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought what your life would look like if you didn't do this? Long story short, it was my small group that encouraged me to take the next right step and go to a Christ-centered 12-step recovery. And so when I was really thinking about it, I would go home, and I'd pray, and I'd talk to Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, in light of my past experience, my current circumstances, and where I hope to be one day, what's the wise thing for me to do? And then I asked him about the recovery. Now, God didn't give me a, Chris, this is God. Yes, I sound like James Earl Jones. Like, no, it wasn't like that. You know, I didn't hear an audible voice respond to me. There wasn't a light shining into the window, you know, going, oh, and I didn't start levitating or anything like that. I just had, you know what? It seems reasonable. It seems logical. It seems better than right or wrong. It seems wise to probably go ahead and do that. And so when I asked God, should I go to recovery? Do you really need me to go to recovery? Can't we just take care of this? You know, honestly, I was trying to cop out. It's like, God, can't we just take care of this on our own? He said, go for it. He didn't say it in an audible voice, but I just had, excuse me, I just had it in my heart and my mind and my stomach. Like, this is, this, is, this is the next right step. And so I went to recovery, and I could tell you, because I took that next right step and kept taking step after step, and it wasn't an easy journey, I'm now sober 15 years from alcohol because I took those next right steps. When I was in debt, eventually my small group would encourage me to go to Financial Peace University. We're going to start that just probably late April, so keep it in your mind. And it helped me learn how to pay off debt, live on a budget, not spend 100% plus of my salary. It taught me how to actually prepare for retirement. It like helped me get out of debt. My wife and I have paid off over $100,000 of non-mortgage debt by learning the principles that scripture had to teach. And it wasn't because Chris is just so like strong and bold and can go to this class and learn a thing and practice it. No, I would never have gone to that class if it was up to me. It was me asking God in prayer, what is the wise thing to do, God, in light of my past situation my current circumstances, and where I'm going. God, what is the wise thing? Should I go to this financial class? And then you know the answer to that one. It's yes. You know, there was, it was the wise option. It would have been legal to not go to that class. It would have been right to not go to that class. It would have been moral to not go to that class. But it was wise for me to go to that class. And so because I kept taking that step, God showed me what it looks like to transition from being the simple person, the simple person that we talked about that's only making decisions for today, and start to step into the category of being the prudent person. You see what he did there? When I started to approach him and I started asking him what's the wise thing for me to do, he helped me learn how to change my behavior and how to transform from being a simple-minded person that only worries about today and sets himself up for failure in tomorrow, and to try to the best of my ability to set myself up for success for the future. He's the one who showed me that there's a third path that's not just right and wrong, but there's the wisdom path that we could take as well. And it sounds dorky and it sounds cheesy, but this is how, like the country song, Jesus Take the Wheel, this is how I literally let Jesus take the wheel. You know what I learned about this whole Jesus Take the Wheel thing? You still got to drive the life. 
right? Jesus doesn't actually take the wheel. He's sitting next to you telling you, giving you options, sharing with you what your next right step is. But you know what's incredible about Jesus? He still gives us the free will. He still lets us act. He still lets us take those decisions. We still have to step out in faith. If he took the wheel, there'd be no faith. We wouldn't have to be concerned. We'd just sit back and relax. But no, that's not the way how Jesus is. He wants you to do the work. There's God's part and there's your part. And so when we say, Jesus, take the wheel, it's not just take the wheel and I'm going to go absent-minded over here. That's simple. We've got to be prudent. We've got to be diligent. And so Jesus, take the wheel. And he took the wheel by sharing with me where to drive. But I still had to turn the driving wheel, right? I still had to hit the gas and the brakes. I had to go down the right path in life. And I had to choose to follow God's wisdom and not my own logic, not the world's logic, but follow God. And so again, this question, in light of my past experience, my current circumstances, or where my hopes are, what is the wise thing to do? You see, I had dreams, I had hopes, I had goals 15 years ago. I wanted to be in a better place. What's amazing is that God has taken my dreams, goals, and hopes that I had 15 years ago and made them really small. He made them really small. He showed me that he can outperform any dream, goal, or hope that I have for my life. I'm in a way better place today than I could have ever dreamed or hoped for 15 years ago. I mean, the fact that I'm your pastor and I'm here and I get to live in this wonderful place called the South with some of the best people on earth, that alone is beyond more than I could have ever imagined. I didn't know I'd be here 15 years ago. I didn't know that I'd have my wonderful wife, my best friend, the love of my life. Like, I wouldn't want to be with anyone else. I mean, y'all have nice spouses, but my wife is the best, okay? I'm just going to be honest with you. And there's no one else I'd want to do life with. She co-parents with me. And my kids... I mean, I might want to smack them once in a while, but I love those little boogers. Like, there's, those kids are better than I could have ever imagined they would be. If I had to come sit down and write out what my kids would look like and be like and who the, their personalities would be like, that's small potatoes compared to who God created them to be. I am so pleased with who God gave me as sons in my life and their personalities. What a blessing. You know, like, I lived in California, and stuff was expensive, and I was in debt, but I thought buying a house would never happen. It wasn't even on my goals. I thought it was unobtainable. And now here I am today, and we bought a house a year ago. But because I choose the wise thing, what's the wise thing to do, God, in that moment when I'm making decisions? Do I buy the house that I can afford if we get a 30-plus-year loan and like push the edges of my budget? Or do I buy way below what my budget can afford so I have extra margin? Do I buy a house where it's no big deal if I get the 15-year mortgage, right? And so I'm asking God, what's the wise thing to do? And he keeps blowing my dreams out of the water. I come up with a dream, and he says, I can do better, Chris. Keep following me. Keep moving on wisdom. We'll change your life one way or another. Now, there's someone in the room today that's saying, well, that's nice for you, Chris. You seem to be the chosen. You're like, the lucky duck of the group. I don't get it that way. Like, God must love you more than he loves me because he doesn't do that stuff to me. He doesn't care about me like he cares about you. I'm just here because I was dragged here today. Like, I'm not even sure if I believe in this Jesus thing. Like, I pretend I'm a Christian, but that's because I grew up in the church, and so I got to pretend I'm Christian. But I don't even know about this Jesus. Like, some of you are struggling, and you think, well, that's nice for you, pastor. I don't have a life like that. First of all, that is a lie from the pit of hell, okay? God loves you. He's crazy about you. He wants the best for you. He's obsessed with you. He's just obsessed with you as he's obsessed with me. And someone in the room is also thinking, well, Chris, this would have been good information to know years ago, but I've kind of train wrecked my life for too many years, too many decades. It's too big of a mess. I can't get there. I want to push back on that for a moment. I'm going to say this. If you've got darkness in your past, you're way more powerful than you realize. Now, let me explain to this, because it sounds like I'm going really (laughs) demonic here, and I'm not. 
If you're a goody two, if you're a goody two shoe Christian, never done anything wrong, like your biggest thing of being wrong was that you're somehow related to Adam, so you needed the sinner's prayer just for that, and that's the only thing wrong you've ever done, which is not true, but we'll just go with it. How powerful is your testimony to someone? Not very powerful because it's not that relatable. Now, if you have darkness in your past, watch out. Because if you start asking God, what is the wise thing to do in light of my past experience, my current circumstances, and where I hope to go, God's going to start rebuilding your life with you if you start walking that out, but he's also going to add a couple things to it. Because this whole following Jesus, you'll start to find out real fast, it's not about you. It really isn't. God wants, loves you and is crazy about you and he wants a relationship with you and then he wants to use you to help your future brothers and sisters in faith find and follow him as well. And so your darkness becomes your brightest light that you could shine into someone's life. My divorce in my past relates me with 50% of the American population. I could sit down with them and I could tell them I know what it's like. I know what it's like to wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning and to be like, is this a movie or is this my life? Like, I know what it's like to have the panic and the stress. I know what it's like to think I'm never going to love a person again. I'm just not going to date anyone again. I'm just going to go like celibacy forever, <laughs> you know, like no more because like, it's just too dangerous, too messy, too painful. I know what it's like to, to wrestle with that. And what that does is it brings me in and then I could share about how God's not done with you yet. He wasn't done with me and he's not done with you and I could share the hope of Jesus with them. Your darkness becomes your most relational asset in your tool belt to help people have a living connection with Jesus. My addiction was one of the most powerful tools that God has used to help me connect other people to his faith. I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to summarize this real quick. God used some of my darkness over and over and over, one-on-one relationships to help people connect with God. But long term, what he would do is he'd help me take next step after next step after next step. And before you knew it, I started doing things that I never thought I would be doing or be involved with, like starting a recovery ministry. When I started a recovery ministry back in California, I should not have been the one to start it, but we did anyways, because it was just like, I guess I'm the guy holding the book. I don't, I don't know what happened here. And so I started the program. I got a team of leaders together. And the first night we opened that doors, 160 people came into the door. And then it kind of settled down at 100 people on average, about the sizes of this room, of population right now, were coming to our recovery group every Wednesday night. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people over the next five to seven years came through that program and got sober and broke free of a hurt, habit, or hang-up. The guy with the divorce in his past, the guy with the failed marriage, one day would be holding the program and saying, hey, to his pastor, I think we should start the marriage enrichment program here. So many hurting marriages. I want to help people avoid the pain that I got in my past. I want to share what I've learned, and I want to lean on what God's done in other people's lives. And you know what? I get to share with marriages that are in bad spots about like what could happen if you don't get your act together. I could share about how there's still a future. I've seen God transform their life, and I could partner with some of you who have that testimony, and you could share it with them. The night that we launched our marriage enrichment program back in California, when we opened the doors, I can't believe this, and I'm not saying this to toot my horn. It's more of like, look at what God can do through your darkness. A thousand people walked in the room that night. That's a big burden when you're the guy on, in charge of the ministry. You're like, a thousand broken marriages are in this room, all 500, because you, du- you double it multiplication, but you get it. You're like, that's a whole lot of brokenness. <laughs> like, okay, let's go for it. I'm not sharing to say, say like, ooh, look at my track record of past success. I'm sharing your darkness. If you're sitting here thinking you've messed up your life too far, too much, and God can't he do it, and God doesn't love you, and you're just, it's messed up, that's not true. It's a lie. It's a lie from the enemy of your soul, and the enemy of your soul doesn't want any goodness happening in your life, and he doesn't want you to do any good in anyone else's life, and so he's trying to trap you, trap you with the burden of sin. But what does Jesus say in Scripture? He says, come to me all of you who are heavy, burdened. My yoke is light. Right? He's not talking to the goody two-shoes. He's talking to you and me that have a past. And he's saying, come, let's do this. 
But I say that in this sermon because I know it sounds like I'm going in a complete different direction than what's the wise thing to do. I say that because too many people say yes to Jesus. They start going to classes. They start only reading their Bibles. They start praying. And then they kind of keep making bad decisions in their life. And I don't, don't hear me wrong. I want you reading your Bibles. I want you praying. But I want you doing something different in your life. It's not just about going through the motions. It's about living differently for Jesus. It's more than just saying, am I doing the right thing or the wrong thing? It's more than just learning what the legalistic rules are to being a Christian. If you're living life by rules, you're doing it wrong. You should be living life by wisdom. God's the most wise being to have ever existed. He's got all the wisdom we need, which is good because I'm a knucklehead left up to my own devices, right? I need to tap into that Holy Spirit for him to speak what the wisdom is so I can do the next right thing in my life. And hopefully, now that God's kind of aligned my heart to be with his over year after year of following him and doing the next right thing by asking him what is the wise thing to do, now I'm more interested in what he wants done than what I want done. His goals are more important to me than my goals now. I want to grow this church, not so I have a big church, so there's people not going to hell. I don't want this church to be growing and full so we can start doing some things and helping other churches and reaching other people who are far away and starting more missions and doing all kinds of things because I want God's kingdom to grow now because he's aligned my heart and he's put this burden on my heart that I care more about what's going on out there than, you know, if one day I have a fancy house or fancy car. You know, really that, that all becomes very trivial when I fall in love with the community and I fall in love with those who are hurting and I want them to experience Jesus. And I know this is a huge pill to swallow for some people. So start small. Start with your dreams, goals, and hopes. Start asking God, is this the wise thing to do? If I've ever preached something that made you uncomfortable and you didn't want to take that next right step, whether it be tithing or prayer or whatever, start asking God this question. God, in light of my past experience, my current circumstances, what is the wise thing for me to do? Two more verses, and I'm going to pray, and we'll be dismissed here. First, when I was going through that like, season of my life, my life was a train wreck, and I started asking that question, what is the wise thing to do? I leaned into Isaiah. Isaiah 43, verse 19. One of my life verses right here. And here's what it says. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You know, I lived a life 15 years ago where I felt nothing was good. Everything was dead. But when I found this verse and I tag teamed it with what's the wise thing to do, it became my hope. Look at this. I am doing a new thing. Regardless of your past experience, regardless of how much brokenness you feel, regardless of how much you've messed it up in life, I am doing a new thing. And when does it start? Now. It doesn't start tomorrow. It doesn't start next week. It doesn't start next month. Stop trying to get right with God and then come to God. Like, stop trying to get your life all figured out, then come to God. No, just come all broken and messy. God's picking you up the way it is. It starts now. Now it springs forth. Let's not wait for next week or next month or next year. Let's do it now. Do you not see that God wants to start now? Basically, that second part of that verse, it's like an illustration. He's going to take the desert, the wasteland, where you don't see anything good, healthy, growing, and he's going to make it an amazing forest with rivers and streams and lakes and wildlife. Now, I know I sound like a Bob Ross painting here, but here's what I'm trying to tell you. God will bring life to your deadness. God will bring light to your darkness. God will bring not just hope, not just inspiration, maybe for today, but long term, he'll bring proven track record to your life. Your testimony will one day be, you know what? God did a new thing in my life at one point. He didn't wait. He did it then. And you know what? It was like a wasteland. There was nothing living. But look at my life now. You'd say my life is full of fruit, full of goodness, full of life. If you met me 15 years ago, you'd tell me to do some work and keep praying. 
But now if you meet me today, you say, he's got a great family, he's a pastor, he's got great friends, life's going good for this guy, because God did a new thing in my life, but I'm not alone. God wants to do a new thing in your life as well. Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Okay, here we go. Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Like, basically, Paul's saying, be careful, do the wise thing, making the most of every opportunity. I'm going to stretch it and say, you have a decision to make every day. Every day, there's opportunities for you to be wise. Make the most of it and be wise every day, because the days are evil. Be very careful then how you live, not as the unwise, but as the wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. What does that even mean? Look, there's a natural gravity pull at our life, culture. We don't live in a morally neutral culture, right? Culture's got like all jacked up and it's got a gravitational pull And it wants to pull wisdom out of your life. And it wants to get you back on that two-way street, right or wrong. It doesn't want you taking that third lane, the Jesus lane, right? It wants you on that other lane. Like, when's the last time you read an advertisement or watched a show with an advertisement in it? And the ad said, now be careful. Take your time. Choose wisely. Be self-controlled. Never. They don't want you practicing wisdom. They want you buying now, 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 do now. Don't think, go now, now. You need to get it now because they're flying off the shelves. There might not be any left for you if you don't do it right now. In fact, you should buy two because they're going so fast. That way you have a backup. Go right now. When's the last time you talked to a sales associate and they told you, go home, think about it, don't worry. You know what? We have plenty. We'll have more for you. In fact, don't come back in a week. Come back in a few months when you really feel comfortable, and then we'll get it all figured out for you. We'll get, it, we'll get you locked in and loaded and sold on all the deals then. You just take your time. It doesn't exist in our culture, right? And that's just on the sales and the commerce side, but you get the idea. Change the category to something else, and you know there's a gravitational pull. You don't have time to think about it. FOMO, fear of missing out. You need to go to that party. You need to go to that event. You need to take that job opportunity. You need to go do this. You need to buy that new car. What are they going to think of you if you don't have that new car? You need to go do all these things, right? Because it's FOMO, fear of missing out. And fear of missing out doesn't stop to think about wisdom. It's all about right or wrong. What do I need to do to stay up with it? That's what Paul's trying to say here. He's like, the days are evil. Don't look to the culture for your guidance. They'll sell you on a whole bunch of badness. They'll lie to your face. You'll end up like Pastor Chris 15 years ago, broken and hurt. You don't got to live that way. You could choose to be wise. You can make the best out of every opportunity. God can do exactly what he did for me for you. Maybe the situations and the outcomes will be different, but he can come in your life and make it new. Notice I'm using the word can because really it's up to you are you going to do it are you going to partner with god are you going to ask him let's start this journey god in light of my past and what i got currently going on in my life and what i hope to have one day going on in my life jesus what's the wise thing for me to do and i promise you if you start asking that with the holy spirit daily it will change your life Because it changed my life 15 years ago when I heard it in a sermon series called The Greatest Question Ever. And it didn't let me down. Asking that question over and over and over daily in my life for the last 15 years has been the greatest question I have ever asked. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity that you're here for us, that we're not alone. That we don't have to choose just right or wrong, but we could choose your way of living, God. It's like above our way of living. Go figure. Holy Spirit, I pray that for my friends, my community, my spiritual family that's sitting here today, Lord. I pray that that's what's on their hearts. I pray that that's where they're going to be. 
I pray that they don't forget this question. In light of my past experience and my current circumstances and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? But God, I know that, ver- that question only has firepower when we connect to your spirit. And that's the first wise thing that we have to do. And so maybe you're in the room today and you need to say yes to Jesus or recommit your life to Jesus. If that's you, the Bible says God's searching your heart and mind, meaning you could just say, I want in, Jesus. I want a relationship with you. You could say that in your mind. You could say that in your heart, and he hears you. You don't have to nod. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to stand up. God's listening to you. Just say it. And if you're saying that in your heart and your mind, would you pray this prayer? Jesus, I accept you as Lord and Savior of my life. I believe you died on the cross and rose again. I ask for forgiveness for my wrongs and I receive your grace, this undeserved forgiveness. I thank you for wiping the slate clean, not keeping records of wrong. And I look forward to God walking with you and seeing what you do in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.